speaking of abandoning things, it's commentary around VCs abandoning later stage investing has opened the pathway for private equity to start eyeing off startups at those later stages. Australian startups raised 1.5 billion across 99 deals in the three months to June 30, making it the sector's strongest quarter in 18 months. Mega VC deals are back, but new founders face a big problem. It's not as easy to sell a business right now. So the likely acquirers that we may have predicted for portfolios aren't there. So we have to go looking at other avenues. Of the three top guys in the world on Wall Street, the blindfolded monkey Monkey beat two of them. (laughs) He beat two of them. That's how ludicrous the idea is. Don, how are you? Hey, buddy, I'm still here. Talk me through it. Was it just a disaster? Maggie started Saturday, and then it was Sunday night that she just, yeah. Then Libby got sick, I guess, Monday lunch and was in a little bit of a, a little bit of a bad way. And then we start the Chris Gillings podcast. Libby's a trooper, right? Like she's an absolute machine. It would take a lot to bring her down. And then Jack started going off at the same time Maggie's going off. And that's when in the middle of the Gillings episode, I get thrown a baby and said, I need you now. And then about an hour later... Matilda goes down, and then at about three o'clock this morning, Don, Dad finally <laughs> went down. I've always been sort of a large land, small house kind of guy. I think it's good for the kids. I, I think that's the best ratio from a capital allocation point of view. We need more than one toilet if five people are going to come down with with a very aggressive gastro. Oh, I just had visions of of Libby throwing all three kids in your office and locking the door. Yeah, man, I've never been to war, but I, man, I've seen some things. There was a point, Jack, where you were with me on the journey because at the eye of the storm, for some reason, my brain did give me a little chuckle that this is soon going to be you, my friend. <laughs> That's what you signed up for, Jack. There's so many things that are not in the brochure. Ah, oh, it's so true. I remember having Mia in bed as a baby one night and just hearing this noise and waking up. And just so I woke up, she projectile vomited into my face. <laughs> Oh, man. The joy. Oh. There's fear in Jack's eyes right now. It's legitimate fear. Oh. What have you been up to, Jack? Not too much. Just rugby on the weekend and then pretty low key and then yeah, just head down working. Aaron, you, you've got to give the update on the rugby. You were playing the, the one other ta- a team in the comp that is actually pretty good. So at the top of the table clash, we got a big win, but we so an awesome Saturday night, big win. But then our fly half who was our best player. He's just signed a contract to go overseas with France, so he's got to leave before the grand final. It's mate, you're our most important player. Like we can't just come off the highest of highs of beating top of the table when you're leaving us. So we're about to see if all of this winning is just a one man show. Yeah. So it's gonna make it a lot harder, but it's gonna make the victory even better. That's good. Aaron, what have you been up to? I have no clue anymore. What have I been doing? Nothing exciting. <laughs> nothing. I have nothing. It's just been work. Maren went away for the weekend up to Cairns. And so I just stayed home and did accounts and end of year reporting. Let's get into some things. A few people that I'd spoken to during the week referenced the ridiculousness of the US election. A couple of little, little funny ones. Hey, on. That's not, um, what the hell is happening here? Okay. X isn't working. I was going to have something nice to say about Elon, but he can get <laughs> stuffed. Oh. <laughs> one time you're going to say something nice about Elon. You were rendered unable to by X. I want to thank all of the incredible men and women who have done such a great job in helping with Florence. This is a tough hurricane, one of the wettest we've ever seen from the standpoint of water. One of the wettest we've ever seen from the standpoint of water. He goes on to say, it's not good. As if it's some sort of definitive statement. <laughs> oh, when you're like, external so, to it, though, it is comical. Like, yeah, it, yeah. And it gives a lot of comedians a lot of If, if you don't think through the consequence. Yeah. The only thing is, for some of our overseas listeners, and um, our overseas listeners is actually growing. So just so we don't come across as holier than thou, we ourselves have some of this stuff creeping in to our system. 
Now, it's one thing for different parties to go at each other. When parties start to eat their own, I think there's some interesting things happening behind the scenes. So I'll... Uh... What do you think? What do you think? What sort of prime minister will Peter Dutton make if he wins? I think that's something we should contemplate with dread. Oh, really? <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Why? Well, he's a thug. Peter's got one tune, and that's been all his political life, and that is division and animosity, generally targeted at immigrants. It's, it is real. He, I couldn't think of anyone less suited to be prime minister of a multicultural society like Australia. No, that's the, no, that's, you look, there's no point pulling my punches. It's an important question. I've given you an honest answer. So that was Malcolm Turnbull, the former prime minister, eating one of his own it yeah all this energy that gets sucked into these kinds of things meanwhile there's actual problems that we need to go and solve i must admit i personally am not a dutton fan just given the way he carries on but it's just interesting the way they're eating each other internally yeah i'm reminded of that little excerpt you shared last week with the uh, comparison of previous debates of u.s politicians compared to now and uh, yeah equally there especially from malcolm turnbull he's normally quite well spoken and articulate and he's not pulling punches. Well, he was. That was quite well spoken and articulate, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Other than a few small corrections. But yes. Uh, Just, uh, it's still a well, long way to go. That's still a oh, very long way. <laughs> yeah. No, Idiocracy no. was it was a what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> let's get on with some let's get on some news. We are releasing a, a whole episode with Crick Chris Gillings. Chris is with 5V Capital and also one of the founders of the Cut Through Vendors Report. That's an hour-long session that I think is really great. It covers a lot of the good bits of the report. It explains how the report's put together, why the report's put together, and I really think gives a bit of depth that this isn't just a bit of data whacked together. I like the effort he goes to it. Yeah, I was really impressed with the why behind the report as well. Yeah, the rigor that goes into it. I think it's a really important a piece of reporting of our ecosystem, it, it, it's something important that we have. And uh, yeah, shout out to Chris and the team that pulls it together. Yeah, so uh, my favorite part was probably just chatting to Chris and confirming that the macro aligns with the micro, what he's seeing at 5V. And it's pretty consistent with what we're seeing at Tribe. And it's probably fair to say we play at um, different ends of the market. They're a lot bigger uh, than we are, and especially in terms of the life cycle. But really enjoyed the chat and appreciate Chris for putting up with us yesterday. It wasn't easy. And He's a good operator and glad to connect. There was an article that's come out today by Tess Bennett from the Financial Review that references the Cut Through Ventures report. And I'd really recommend people, obviously, have a listen to our episode where we go into a, a deep dive. But Tess in this article says, Mega VC deals are back, but new founders face a big problem. Some of the key parts in there. Australian startups raised $1.5 billion across 99 deals in the three months to June 30, making it the sector's strongest quarter in 18 months, thanks to a return of mega venture capital deals. But it's a two-speed sector. Some are struggling to meet investors' high expectations. After a slow start to the year, six local startups closed deals worth more than $100 million to raise a combined $935 million in the second quarter, which came from the cut-through ventures report and then Tess lists out a whole lot of other impressive data that came from the report so without wanting to take too much away from our episode what was just interesting is just the size of some of those really big deals and there's a lot of talk in the ecosystem and in later parts of this schedule of how it is like Australian companies can't find that money I think it's more that the Australian companies sometimes find it hard from all Australian investors because a lot of these deals brought in other investors. But to me, where the money's coming from is a bit irrelevant, isn't it? As long as it's coming. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Look, there probably is something in terms of ecosystem development. If it was all coming locally and then all recycling locally, great. But the, yeah, I think the reality stays true that good companies are getting funding. I think the other one for me out of that, and I know we talk about in the episode, was but just the addition of that page on AI and investor sentiment around AI. And yeah, we joke internally that maybe we're the only investors that aren't touching AI right now, but it turns out there was something like 50% basically aren't interested. We often, that are we the only VCs that don't touch AI? Uh, but it turns out something like 50% of VCs have no interest at the moment in investing in, an, it's AI-led how they've defined it, 
But I thought that was quite an interesting stat, even though we, there's a lot of talk of capital raises and frothy valuations, but a lot of investors are just simply not excited by it. I put that down to us being an emerging ecosystem. If we were mature like the US, I think a lot of fund managers would be willing to take the higher risk bet. Yeah, I think there's some truth in that, absolutely. And speaking of higher risk bets, in the article by Tess Bennett as well, she talks about a story of Serj Singh and Kavita Nadan. They're a husband and wife team who founded a workforce startup called Locumate.ai. Now, they've been struggling to raise US $1.5 million, which is about $2.2 million Aussie, from local VCs since February. The pair told the Australian Financial Review they've contacted 30 local VCs and seven, and have presented to seven of their investment committees. Mr. Singh was quoted as saying, I was shocked by the requirements for pre-seed and seed funding in Australia at the moment. They're asking to see a minimum of $1 million in reoccurring revenue, Mr. Singh said. One unnamed investor described the market, which was bifurcating into haves and have-nots. We've never seen it busier at the top of the funnel than we were at the first half of 2024. That said, a far lower percentage of deals progressed beyond our initial review stage than prior years. For those that progressed, we found ourselves in a competitive process with many investors fighting for allocation. The anonymous investor said, we believe most VCs are prioritizing opportunities with a high likelihood of solid returns over opportunities with a slim chance of phenomenal returns. So there's a couple of things that I thought would just be worthy to, to touch on. To your point, Jack, it's part of being more of a, an emerging ecosystem that has emerging managers. We are looking for the likelihood of solid returns rather than moonshots of one-off and animal returns. We don't have, we don't have the history and the backing to swing and, and make lots of misses where these entrepreneurs are pointing out that seed and pre-seed is requiring revenue. In my experience, there's still plenty of companies willing to do proper seed and pre-seed investors, but they do it because they believe there is a good chance of getting into revenue. What I find is that, especially me personally, if I don't really believe it or I don't understand it or they haven't demonstrated a good case as to why this thing gets off the ground, the easiest excuse is just to say, come back to me when you've got a million dollars worth of revenue because then your clients will have demonstrated something that I clearly just can't see or understand at the moment. Yeah, I think the other thing in that little quote there, was talking about never being busier at the top end of the funnel. And I guess if it comes back to, if you're measuring every cold inbound deal you see that is, a lot of it is just spam that doesn't fit an investment thesis, then yeah, we're seeing, a, I'm getting a lot more cold inbound hit my inbox, but they haven't even taken a second to look at our focus or thesis and immediately we rule it out. But to think that we're not then doing deals on those because we're looking for these other criteria, they just fundamentally don't meet our criteria at all. I think we're seeing probably fewer deals that are high quality maybe. But that said, we've, we've been looking at a couple recently taking deep dives on that look very promising. I, I totally agree with what you said. If the excuses come back to me when you hit a million dollars revenue, like if they're putting a threshold on the revenue, they're, they're clearly not backing you enough because you wouldn't let the next unicorn fall through the cracks if it doesn't meet the revenue. I wonder if it, one of the things that was predicted, if you subscribe to the thesis that there's more competition in the middle of the VC market and more fund managers in that space competing, then the prediction was more of those VCs would go earlier stage. So is this just a, is this data point basically just VC shifting earlier, but not actually understanding the kind of assessment they should be making of those seed stage investments maybe, and, and having this unrealistic expectation? I don't know. It's just something that it was forecast that we'd see more mid-tier VCs in the saturated part of the market moving earlier. So maybe that maybe it's a data point confirming that. But what is the mid-tier? Is that like seed? Because now early is pre-seed. That, I think that's the point. It, it, they've all been moving earlier to capture deal flow because they haven't been able to. Yeah, I so, think like when you look at Blackbird and Airtree, like as soon as one of them goes earlier, the other one has to follow because once they, they put an allegation into a company, good luck for the competitor getting in. Yeah. If they believe the thesis, there's so many Blackbird and Airtree companies that with no revenue, just with a team, an idea, a plan, a, you can get pre-seed money if all of the ingredients stack up. I think blaming 
Like I, I just think that people need to look through and just realize that actually it's an easy excuse if you're being told I need revenue because you just aren't demonstrating what a pre-seed or a seed investor needs to see in order to take that swing. Without specific examples, it, it's really hard to draw a conclusion. But As if we need specific examples or <laughs> any form of truth or what are you Data. about? Um, That's right. What was the name of our, the alternate name of our podcast? The Cheap Seats or something? The Cheap Seats, yeah. And so, Aaron, there was a post that you had found um, during the week that I guess is making the point that whether it's seed, pre-seed, series A, are investors like us going to be totally irrelevant by software? Yeah, so th this was a post, the rise of the robot investors, is AI about to eat VC's lunch? And it was interesting. There was some statement of the obvious. VC funding is opaque and exclusive. and But it just talked about this opportunity and it referenced the amount of capital flowing to female founded and all women teams and some of the biases in our system and kind of projecting AI could be the answer to remove those biases, make it more inclusive, offer funding to more diverse range of founders. And it ended with the line, startups deserve better. Yeah, I think we're forgetting the fiduciary duty to LPs, right? Like it's yeah. <laughs> talking about startups, I'm talking about the person's putting in their money. Yeah, look, I totally concede fundraising is hard. It's shit. We've done it ourselves with Tribe. It's not enjoyable. And this idea that... AI is necessarily going to fund startups that aren't getting funded by existing investors. It, if we break it down, why don't people get funded that believe they should? The, the, the problem is, is this certainty versus uncertainty thing. The more certainty in an uncertain world you can create in the investor's mind, the more likely you are to raise. And so what's being implied with these kinds of things is that AI is going to be able to produce more certain outcomes because it's going to be able to access data sets or different bits and pieces. And I don't know if that's true. Like it can go and get data that demonstrates that when certain ingredients are at the team level, different demographic, different types of team members, it can go and get data and say that this type of team composition does better than this type of team composition. But that team composition is still overlaid on the opportunity, the TAM, the timing, the, you know, insert different criteria here. Just saying if we optimize for a few things, if it was that easy, wouldn't we be fucking doing it? <laughs> yeah. And looking at AI the way it is now, like to the extent that it's machine learning over a data set, which is pattern recognition, which is what I guess we do. Could it be more objective than us and we're overly biased, subjective animals? Absolutely. But it's... AI is yet to reach the point where it can form a hypothesis, like where it can actually come up with a new thesis based on previous. And when I think about us and, and some of the views we have on certain opportunities, a lot of it is more hypothesis than pattern recognition. So I, that's where I don't think AI is there yet. And the other little signal I just picked up from this post, and I noticed there was a comment in there that the author kind of said, oh, I'm advising startups that are playing the pitching numbers game. And I was like, if you're playing the pitching numbers game, you're probably not the type of company investors are looking for. I think there's a few little biases that are signaled out of this out of this piece. I think the lagging and the the lag is going to be LPs getting comfortable trusting AI by itself. And I think VCs are often put into like the gut feel realm of investing there's definitely like other types of investing like quant and like you look at just a pure financial model and i could definitely see ai moving that path but it's that trust piece that the gp has with the lp and we were just talking off air don about the relationship game and how important that is like that's i think there's that's going to take a long time to build that and the bit that i'm i'm still trying to work through and understand that if we had parallel universes the same idea, product, market, all of that stuff, but in different founders' hands, does very differently. That same ingredients in one set of founders' hands goes broke, goes bankrupt. They fuck it up. In another founder's hands, because of leadership, communication, ability to network, like more personality trait things, they go to the moon. And... That for me is where I'm most interested in and where Tribe spends a lot of time is actually on that soft skill stuff because we just see it time and time again. The best product doesn't win 
but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how AI evaluates those things. I, I, I quite often think about, you don't even need AI to cut out the real estate agent. Like it's just a marketplace. We have the technology and the platform already like overseas purple bricks, but it didn't work in Australia. And it goes back to that trust element. So it's will AI eat our lunch? Like we had the technology to eat the real estate agent's lunch a long time ago, but I don't ever see that being fully cut out. Maybe the agent's role today will look different tomorrow and it might actually just be a representative to the marketplace that dominates and has critical mass. But I think there'll always be that human element because if we look at the biggest asset for the average person is their home and that's what circa a million dollars. Same thing in this game. Like it's you're managing a lot of money for people and there's that trust element that takes a long time to to get. That's a really good point, Jack. Like when I think of the promise of blockchain being this source of truth ledger and therefore trustworthy. But yet you look at the applications of, of blockchain and in crypto and other things, people don't trust it as much as they trust a bank that's run by people. Ultimately, I guess one of the questions that's trying to be answered is, can we be smarter than a monkey? <laughs> oh, this post was hilarious. I'll just play this because it is partly relevant. Wall Street Journal did this years ago. They took a monkey and blindfolded it and handed it darts and they had all the stocks on the wall and the blindfolded monkey threw darts and picked stocks wherever the dart hit. They got three of the top guys on Wall Street to pick any single stock or any three single stocks that they wanted to pick to compete with the blindfolded monkey's dart portfolio. Of the three top guys in the world on Wall Street, the blindfolded monkey beat two of them. He beat two of them. That's how ludicrous the idea is, is that you're going to screw around with single stocks and actually win. Why are we better than a blindfolded monkey throwing darts? Well, maybe we're not. I was going to say, there's an assumption in the way you ask that question that we actually are better. We'll find out in 10 years. Ah, But yes, maybe we do need to change our investment thesis. Just hire some monkeys. (laughs) <laughs> what's being discussed there is the public markets and the reality is the public markets have just so many different timing categoristics and yes the best businesses rise to the top over the long term but the long term can be five years 10 years 20 years it takes in the short term there's so many different factors i guess with vc we're trying to apply a bit of pattern recognition but create some scenarios where our help and guidance can also create some return support where when you're a, a listed market investor, you've got no chance. Yeah, and, and that's a key point of difference in that unlike a monkey throwing a dart and that's the sum total of the process, we are actively engaged with companies afterwards and to the back on the point of AI, like that hands-on support where we aim to add value and, and actually increase the value of a company post-investment is something that I don't see AI replacing us soon. Maybe one day, but not sometime soon. And seeing as this episode is a little bit silly, I thought I'd just read this. Um, it, it can't be that hard because as a reminder, 30 years ago, Forrest Gump came out and still has Hollywood's greatest angel investment ever when Forrest Gump and Lieutenant Dan bought into Apple. In this timeline, they got to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in September 1975, which is six months before the launch. And prior to their first check, from Mike Markula, who invested 250K for one third of Apple in 1977. Since Gump and Dan were unsophisticated shrimp guys instead of tech investors, they probably got waxed on valuation and paid 100 grand for 10% of Apple. Now, Gump is a loyal dude, so presumably he sold everything when Jobs was booted in 1985. On the other hand, he thought Apple was a fruit company and is financially illiterate. So Gump is likely still holding that stake, which is now worth $350 billion. My calculator broke trying to work out the ROI. Anyway, so. <laughs> I love Angel. that someone actually took their time to, to do that maths and pull that together. This next item, this is the first time on a run sheet I've seen you've come in and in, in yellow highlight put in there, this was a joke. So you're suggesting this next post is not actually... <laughs> From my interpretation of the author's comments, it was tongue-in-cheek and, and not legit. But, but the interesting thing was the number of people who commented thinking it was legit. And so that... I think in the spirit of Forrest Gump, we should let the listeners find out. 
Okay. None of my intelligent, i.e. 130 plus IQ friends use GPT-4. They only use it selectively and rarely, but almost never use it spontaneously in their own time. This has long been consistent, but today confirmation came. A new meta-analysis showed that using chat GPT increases exponentially with a lower IQ with drop-offs to near zero at 145 plus. ChatPT is mostly appealing as a way to fill an otherwise vacant mind that has no interesting thoughts and minimal goal-directed behavior. Intelligent people find stimulation not from meandering in a vaguely pleasant GPT-4 slop like a soggy potato sitting in an oil on a dirty oven tray. I love that people bite on this. Like it's so funny on LinkedIn. So good. So bloody good. Oh, but it was such oh. a good post. Yeah, but watching people bite in the comments was... was Man. <laughs> LinkedIn is actually out of hand. The amount of people that bite at satire, like it's come on. But this is the world. D- differentiating satire, fact and fiction is just becoming... It's an increasingly blurred line. I've deleted all social media. Why? Facebook, Instagram, threads... I've deleted. LinkedIn, I still have on my computer because obviously we've got to do marketing and do different bits and pieces. It just was a killer and not good for my brain, not good for the family. And after a little a little session on the weekend, it was like, no, nah, I've got to start again. Just delete it. I, yeah, I reckon social media is our cigarettes. The amount of brain space and the ability just to get stuff done now that my brain knows that there ain't any dopamine stuff sitting on that phone, like I've tripled productivity. I love it. Oh, I think it's so healthy to get rid of them. Now, the problem is the charts section predominantly comes from Twitter because I've built up a big Twitter following, as in I follow people on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody nobody, nobody follows me. But Twitter has actually been very bad for my mental health as well because when you go on the For You bit, the amount of death that I've seen, like you don't know what you're watching until someone's fucking head gets blown off. Like so much Russian war stuff, like car act, like the problem, and it just catches you. There's some really disturbing shit. And so for this week's charts, as an example, I reinstalled it quickly, went through just mine, but it is an unhealthy place. It is the wild west. Yeah. I left Twitter a bit about six months ago. I can't, it's a dumpster fight. It's scary. The shit that you can access on that. Not even just access. It's fed to you. It's toxic. You used to have to go searching through the dark web for the half that crap and now bang. <laughs> yeah. Not that anyone's going to notice that I'm not on social media. I don't think they're going to be sitting there going, oh, I haven't seen a post from Don or he's not commented on any of my stuff. I think <laughs> no one will notice. But it is just, yeah, it was just getting to me. So get ready, boys. But what am I getting ready for? <laughs> Your absence? My... <laughs> No, my expenses are going to be instead of like three months late, no more than a month late. I love it. Like, look, look now, at this. the best, actually, the best part from yesterday chatting to Chris is when he thought it was like strategic that we hadn't posted an episode. And it's like, <laughs> I wish that. No, I'm sorry. It's more the time. It's the time. I don't we think people realize that for. every hour of a potty, it's literally four hours. Or like the Chris one, I think I started at eight this morning. And it was done at about two. So, yeah, it's about four hours. Anyway, how do we segue? God, I don't even know how we started on that, but what are we up to? Speaking of abandoning things, this commentary around VCs abandoning later stage investing has opened the pathway for private equity to start eyeing off startups at those later stages. Yeah, so there was a article in Capital Brief by Bronwyn Clune saying private equity funds are increasingly looking at venture style deals in the Australian market as startups like Blackbird and Airtree issue later stage rounds, which is what we've just been discussing. They are going earlier and earlier to be able to catch some of that. Bronwyn in this article says private equity firms best known for leveraged buyouts of established companies and roll ups in consumer sectors like retail, fast food, and healthcare, and increasingly turning their attention to startups and software businesses. When I was reading this article, for me, there's sort of like a definitions thing coming as this market matures. Calling Canva a startup, calling any of these big companies that are on series C, D, E, like the starting of the up ended a long time ago. These are companies that are producing results. And then now because the Australian market has matured, like PE, in my view, is still doing partly what PE does. 
but these companies have more consistent cash flow, more consistent growth. They're, they're probably not doing the financial engineering stuff as much as they may have been. But I, I think like even private equity versus VC, like for us, VC versus angel, we cross over so much in those terms. But yeah, that, that's one of the things that came to mind when I was reading it. No, I had the same thought, like the, the commentary that PE is moving into this space of later stage. Like when you look at the revenue of those businesses and the size, like PE often plays in that that space of small, even smaller companies than that. Like it's it might be moving into a place that was previously typically attracting venture capital as investment, but I don't really see. Well, I, th I think the point that is being made in this article, and I agree that like venture capital is putting capital in for growth funding losses. It's more influence type capital, I think would be fair to say. PE is really more about optimization, financial engineering, cash flow. That's what I believe mm. PE looks like. Now, in everything, there's black and white and shades of gray, and then there's a transition period. Like Canva is transitioning, and some of the other companies that are mentioned in here, they're transitioning out of VC world into PE and out of PE, they're going to go into listed. And once they're enlisted, they'll have all of that shit to deal with, including activists, if they don't like some of the results. Like it's a series of transitions that's happening. Yeah. The only point to add is it's not as easy to sell a business right now. So the likely acquirers that we may have predicted for portfolios aren't there. So we have to go looking at other avenues and PE is a potential avenue and I could see PE companies coming in and pretty much doing a, a tech roll up in certain verticals where there's been a commoditization. Yeah. Come in, do the roll up. Yeah. And it's do, not. Do what PE does, flip it off. Yeah. And it's not a, a venture acquisition, right? Like this is, they'll be buying you out for a multiple on your EBITDA, which is likely low. So very different game. Now, also by uh, Bronwyn in Capital Brief, she wrote another article, private equity in the firing line as VCs push back on aggressive terms. And so the first article was about PE going in, and this article is looking at the terms, and it says private equity firms like Quadrant and Federation Asset Management are increasingly investing in later stage. VCs are divided of whether this is a good thing or not. It's definitely true that PE firm's starting point is much less founder-friendly, one prominent VC told Capital Brief. That's not all that surprising given their background is owning and controlling companies, whereas ours, i.e. VC, is as a minority investor influencing but not controlling. Two firm named by venture capitalists, Quadrant and Federation, launched new strategic equity funds last a year ago, which was viewed as a significant change in direction for the fund, allowing it to take minority stakes in growth companies. Yeah. And then this is a line from the article as well. We don't invest in startups, only companies in profit and growth. And so again, the PE people there are saying these companies that some people in our ecosystem call startups, they don't see them as startups. They've got profit cash growth. Now, in the article, it says one source close to a recent deal said that Quadrant attempted to push through, but was not accepted by the founder. Coupons that accumulated over time and controls over management decisions at the company. So they wanted an additional rate that uh, accrued on top of their preference in the equity stack. And then there's another company mentioned, Sendal, in which the private equity firm reportedly asked for a four times liquidation pref with a VC describing the deal as bonkers. Those are aggressive terms, four times liquidation pref. Now, later in the article, it says the reason why some of this stuff is happening because founders don't want to take a hit on their vow. And so the PE saying, all right, you want to maintain amazingly high valuations, fine. I need a four times liquidation pref or I need coupon or I need whatever those things are. Now, if you're talking to a PE firm of that size, you've left the startup realm and maybe you've got to take your medicine on valuation. Yeah, I think partly sign of the times, but yeah, I think you're right. And there's probably a high chance like they don't have much optional optionality and that's why we're even talking about it because that other options are just be pushed aside, right? You take the ones with less aggressive terms and this would be a thing of the past. Yeah, on one company that we did a an additional 
investment into the terms were set by the larger partner we're only a, a smaller partner but the founders were adamant that they didn't they wanted to stick to a certain role and and the larger shareholder said okay but we need to have a liquidation pref in the event that the things don't quite work out otherwise we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to reach our return thresholds and for founders listening like that just caps the downside of the investor's money for listeners if there's a if there's a two times liquidation pref and the investor put in five million, that means two times that five, so ten, the first ten million flows out to the investor. Now, if they've been in the investment for say ten years and they got two times their money back, that's a failure. The IRR on that is incredibly poor. Yeah. Now, why do whether it's PE or VC or any investors end up having to come up with some of these terms? The reality is that not all companies work out, not all companies survive for the long term. I was really surprised to see Booktopia has been put into voluntary administration. I did not know until I saw this in the notes. That's a pretty big and well-known brand. So this article was by Simon Thompson from Startup Daily, and it says, end of story, ASX listed online retailer Booktopia hits voluntary administration. Now... It's a 20-year-old business founded in 2004, the same day as Facebook. Now, Booktopia went public in December 2020, raising $43 million at $2.30 for a market cap of $315 million. And now it's gone into administration. I've got to say with online retail though, so yeah, Maren's been buying all sorts of things online for the wedding and having difficulty with returns and deliveries. My experience with Amazon almost... It would be less than 24 hours from order to delivery, often delivering on the weekend. And the one item I did have an issue with, which was faulty, refund, no costs, simple money back in my account almost immediately. And when I compare it to buying it from elsewhere online, it, I'm now at the point where I just go straight to Amazon, even if I'm going to pay a little bit more. 100%. I really should delete the Amazon app. Not like the other day I'm in the caravan and there's some stains on the on a couple of the things. And and like, you know what would be good is one of those water vacuum cleaners. Have you seen those that put the soap and stuff? You saw that on, on TikTok, TikTok, didn't you? You shut your, how you, you you how shut your mouth when you're talking to me, Jack. <laughs> so Just walking I, around using Trumpisms like it's the wettest <laughs> in a water sense of any vacuum. <laughs> so literally I go into Amazon. Bang. Here within hours. So good. So we'd like to thank Amazon as our new sponsors and hopefully- get As our stuff. future sponsor, yeah. But this is sad about Booktopia. And, and this is the thing. When I saw this, I was reflecting. I used to buy off Booktopia a lot, and but I have not purchased in over a year. But the point coming back to why are some investment terms so aggressive? Why do investors need to see some of these returns that founders think are a little bit crazy? Even when it's successful, it often doesn't last long. And the majority of things don't even get to that level of success. But here's a great brand that got to ASX listed status, multi-hundred million dollar market cap. One of the things that it does talk about in the article, however, it says the wheels fell off soon after a battle between the co-founder, Tony Nash, and the board for control of the business as economic headwinds grew. He was ousted as CEO in early 22. And then the share price lost 90%. Several board members departed. You find me a company that's gotten into trouble. I know I keep saying this in a lot of episodes. They didn't traverse the change loop. Things started to change, right? Market forces, whatever it might be, change started to happen, which then created problems that needed to be solved. When you don't solve a problem, it becomes a crisis and crisis of what kill company. Now, what stops people solving a problem? It's when all that energy goes into conflict and disintegration and internal fighting. And what happens is the company's energy gets sucked into that. Then it can't go off and do what it needs to do. And anytime I see a company that has just disappeared, look under the hood and you'll find that they somewhere along the line lost trust and respect, a bit like what's happening inside America right now. Problems start coming up that become crises. All the energy gets sucked into internal conflicts they die. It's happened again. Yep. Given my state of mind, my energy levels and booktopia, I thought we'd just keep on the sad theme. And I guess our joint love for aviation, did you see that the hydrogen plane startup 
called Universal Hydrogen that unfortunately collapsed. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, but have we seen any examples of hydrogen aircraft being adopted anywhere yet? I know it's, an, it's new and emerging, but it feels like much hyped yet to be commercialized. Well, the thing I'm reminded for the sort of deeper tech, longer term things is that it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. You have these early innovate, you have these early innovators and a lot of capital flowing into the market. But as the article pointed out, they were simultaneously trying to build like a new technology. Then you've got to set up all the infrastructure layer. One of the challenges with hydrogen is that it doesn't have the same density as petrol. And at the moment, we can't get enough of it from green sources. It actually takes a lot of energy to create hydrogen. So you've got this double whammy of trying to solve so many different bits and pieces. But there was a part of the article that aligns back to some of the earlier topics. It says, speaking to the Financial Review, Mr. Barrett said that the startup, which was being led by former Chief Technology Officer Mark Collins, who had stepped into the CEO role, had been trying to raise funds since last year. Last year wasn't a good time to raise money. We had a lot of we had a lead for a significant round, but that lead investor was unable to fund it. It's the $50 million check that's hard. It's not the $5 million check or the $500 million check. It's the $50 million check that's really hard. So he was just talking about being stuck in that, in that middle ground. A lead investor that wasn't able to fund it. I think what they're saying is they had the lead investor, but they couldn't get the other capital to go around the lead investor. Because if the lead investor didn't have the capital, they're not the lead investor. Yeah. These sort of plays, massive capital required. And yeah, like you said, the infrastructure layer that's got to sit over the top of something like this. And that's a huge challenge. And that's the thing, right? A lot of founders and even probably investors would think that if you'd gotten to a point of having investors such as American Airlines, Toyota, Airbus, and General Electric, like those were the other investors. Just Wasn't really... Twiggy Forest in there too? Yeah, and, think... and, and Twiggy Forest and Playground Ventures. Yeah, they burnt through $150 million of investor capital, but clearly those investors felt that administration was a better path and didn't want to continue to fund it. Yeah. Yeah, super tough. It does remind me, like in, for founders who are doing something more like a SaaS play, the often forgotten other elements that a customer has to take on or do or change internally to use your piece of software and understanding the true cost. So you might have the most innovative technology, but- and I know this is an exaggerated extreme with a hydrogen aircraft needing all sorts of new infrastructure at airports and other things. But equally, if you're selling SaaS into an enterprise and that requires them to change workflows or integrate into different systems or retrain staff, like the true cost of that application and change can be an inhibitor to them taking on your new technology, regardless of how amazing it is. Jack, would you get on a hydrogen powered plane? Absolutely not. It'll blow up. <laughs> really? Why is it any different to jet fuel? Right, are you, are you, Don, you're pro hydrogen cars. Is that right? Is that what? Well, 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 well. So what I'm, in my life's experience, the thing that everybody says is going to be the thing never is the thing. So just battery technology, then take batteries for trucking and long haul and whatever else. Like to me, it just doesn't make sense. Something else is going to come. If you take hydrogen, if we can find a green way to produce it, and then people start to get their own little hydrogen generator. Like I can imagine something the size of a hot water system one day connected to your solar panels or whatever, creates your hydrogen, you just fill up your cell at home or whatever. Like I can just see something like that coming to um, fruition. Now, I'm not technically proficient enough to know if it can be aircraft based because it, hydrogen does have less energy density than, than traditional fuel. I don't know much about hydrogen, but when we were having this conversation with an investor that knew a little bit more than I do, they were saying the risks for cars is that like they, it, that the likelihood of blowing up is a high risk. I suppose when you think of aircraft, if the aircraft falls out of the sky, fuck, it doesn't matter if it's petrol, hydrogen, like you're screwed anyway. So I changed my answer is yes, I will probably be getting on that hydrogen plane. <laughs> Yeah, but hang on, Jack. Falls out of the sky. You don't want to blowing up, though. <laughs> like, yeah, no, no. If we, if we fall out of the sky and hit cement, like, we're done, <laughs> regardless of whatever's in there. I know Emerald coaches, they, they were toying with this idea of do they go electric with their buses or hydrogen? And, and, and they, last I heard, they, they were definitely trialing hydrogen and actually had decided to go hydrogen because they could br bring their production 
on site was one thing. So they refueling, everything can happen at, at the station. But it was also that the total energy efficiency, like the hydrogen production that could be run off renewables and after hours and all these sort of factors, they, they actually hydrogen over electric seemed to be their conclusion. I don't know enough about the science, but I can just, to me, it just makes sense that especially like farming and primary production and manufacturing, at, at some point, there's a way of having your own little hydrogen generator with a tractor, right? In farming, there's no way they can be battery operated. Like it just, I just don't see it as ever possible. So therefore, humanity is going to allocate R&D funds to other things. And I believe that in that allocation, the other things is going to find an alternative to batteries. Because if, it, if we can find an alternative to battery for the big things, it's definitely going to reverse engineer back into the little, isn't it? Yeah, I would have thought so. I think, it'd be, I think there might be a point, though, if the battery technology advances to the point where you get longer battery life out of smaller form, lighter weight, and there, therefore it becomes less of an issue? I don't know. We might pass it. I'm going to name shot. this episode. Jack, I like the fact that you liked my previous episode's name, <laughs> but this episode I'm going to name something like we hypothesized on things we have absolutely no <laughs> idea about, <laughs> which is what we do day to day. <laughs> and, and for listeners who may be investors, we don't invest in deep tech. <laughs> Okay, let's get to some charts, shall we? Sounds good. So this is Australian data. This is fixed rate home loans versus variable rate home loans. I guess it makes sense because it's the same thing that happened with me. I was fixed rate and then I went variable once the fixed rate started shooting through the roof. But fixed rates now equate to about 3% of new residential home loans and 90% of variable. Whereas pre-COVID, it was about 20%. In the beginning of COVID, it jumped to 40%. There was obviously a lot of smart people that went, holy moly, yeah, five-year money at 2%. two But yeah, just interesting that it's now fallen to 3%. Now, investors as a percentage of residential loans, I found this a little bit interesting given the way property prices. Back in 1992 and the really early 90s, investors equated to around about 5% of loans. Then over the next 20 years, it got to about 45% of loans and it's hovered around there. During the GFC, it dropped to 30%. Then it climbed up to 45%. Now, pre-COVID, it dropped to 25%. But it's been growing from 25% up to 37%. My gut feel is that this is about rising investors as residential loans and residential owners of property. That's got to be to do with negative gearing and capital gains concessions. Now, this is US data. This is going back to the 1960s, but this is a consumer survey of the buying conditions of people considering to buy a home. And the heading of this chart is people don't feel like buying homes. So what's interesting, as COVID's come along, and I guess housing's got more and more expensive, it's just died. But it's, 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 it oscillates, right? It oscillates around recessions. During recessions and after recessions, it goes up as the economy rebounds and restabilizes. But pre-recession, when it's getting more and more expensive, it falls down. And now we're at record lows, back to where it was since, what, 1976 and then 1982, around the times of the last big recessions. Look, I can tell you, in SA, it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> it feels like every man and their dog want to buy a home. Yeah. I wonder if it's because of this chart in the US. So this next chart is the unemployment rate in the US. What I just love about this data set is just how smooth it is. A body in motion stays in motion. And so when you have a look at this chart, it's going back to 1948 and it's just the unemployment rate and it swings from 1948 as 4% up to 8% and then it drops down to 2.5%, then up to 6%, then down to 3% and it just blah, blah, blah. And so in the modern era, we bottomed out in April 2000 at 3.8% and it went to 6.3%. Then we had the washout of the tech wreck and that whole recession environment, and we had some growth and it dropped to 4.4%. Then the GFC came along and it went from 4.4 up to 10%. Then post GFC, it dropped from 10% down to 3.5%. COVID came along and we had a big spike from 3.5 to 14, but then it dropped to 3.4. But now it's climbing ever so surely up to 4.1%. Now, if you look at all the other time series, once this thing starts turning, it just keeps turning. This next chart is the PE 
and a few other ratios of Apple. And what's interesting is that Apple historically has had a 20 times PE multiple and has gotten as low as 12. But right now, that multiple's 35. So yes, their earnings are expanding, but actually it's these multiples. Like the EV to EVDA ratio, normally is 15, it's currently 26. On average, it's 15, it's currently 26. Price to sales ratio, on average, it's five times. It's now 9.2 times. Previously, it's been as low as three times. So there is a huge amount of expectation on the shoulders of someone like Apple. This chart is the market capitalization of AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA. Just look at the difference between NVIDIA and its peers. Like for those at home, between 2009 and say 2020, they were all roughly the same. Then NVIDIA just goes hockey stick from a few hundred up to three trillion. Whereas AMD and Intel, they haven't caught a break. So investors are certainly marking them down. And then speaking of US equities, this chart here is emerging markets versus US equities. This is a ratio between them. And you can see a bit like the unemployment chart, this is a nice trending chart as well. It gets low at around about 0.5 to 1. So in 1970, in 1973, in 1986, 1997, and then again in 2001, like this was the bottom of this chart was like 0.6 to, to 1. Whereas at the peak, when emerging markets are really outperforming the US, it's like 2.5, 5.5, 3.5. Now at the moment, it's a historical lows. It's coming close to 0.6 or 0.7 as a ratio comparing the two. That's going to be an interesting one to watch because when this turns, it tends to turn well and that will signal that there's only two choices. Either the emerging markets go up faster than the US or the US falters. Then these are just a couple of randoms. I just thought this was funny. Fall in love with your problems. Maybe they'll leave you too. <laughs> and then underneath it says, sorry about this wall. Fairly a, a bit aggressive. I just want to know where that is. What building is that on? I've forgotten what the next one is. Oh, this is 10 dangerous personalities to avoid. The zebra. Zero evidence, but really arrogant. The wolf working on the latest fire. The rhino, really here in name only. The seagull, senior executive that always glides in, <laughs> unloads and leaves loudly. The dodo, dangerous outdated opinions. The viper, vindictive person endangering results. The mouse, muddled opinions usually swayed easily. The parrot, Pretty annoying and ridiculously repeating others. The donkey, data only, no knowledge, expertise, or why. <laughs> and the hippo, highest paid person's opinion. I think we could almost correlate each of our podcast episodes to one of these quadrants. <laughs> the episode or the guest? The guests are fine, it's us. And then think like a farmer. I thought that this was actually quite clever and with some of the other stuff that I do or that we all do, think like a farmer. Don't shout at the crops. Don't blame the crop for not growing fast enough. Don't uproot the crop before they've had a chance to grow. Choose the best plants. Choose the best plants for the soil. Irrigate and fertilize. Remove weeds. Remember, you'll have good seasons and bad seasons. You can't control the weather. Only be prepared for it. Love it. As a short little thing for managing people, it isn't that bad. Would a, like, would, would a farmer go up and yell at, at a crop for not doing what it wants or not growing, or maybe you do. I don't know, but no, I, I love it. I think that's uh, good sage advice for parenting too. Yep. Don't yeah. shout at the crops. <laughs> yeah, don't shout at the crops. <laughs> yeah, if, were, if you can. Yeah, don't blame the crops for not growing fast enough. <laughs> remove Just remove your stage the weeds. Of the life cycle. It's a little. <laughs> the teenage right, years. What are we? What are we looking forward to? I'm looking forward to feeling good again. That's a worthy thing to look forward to. And this would be the time, the perfect time to be plugged into social media as well. I could doom scroll my way out of it, but no, nah, I'm sticking to it. I'm, I've deleted it. What are you looking forward to, Aaron? <laughs> I, I sound so boring. What am I looking forward to? I don't even know what I'm doing this weekend. I have nothing. Can you come back to me? Jack, what are you looking forward to? I'm in the same boat that we've got to buy this weekend. No rugby. I haven't got any plans. I think... 
We're looking at a few houses, but just oh, Jack, where are we looking? Pretty much anywhere right now. There's not it's like super competitive. Not that much in the markets. Looking everywhere. Speaking of which, I just remember what I'm looking forward to. The Palm Go Palm Cove house goes to auction tomorrow. Oh wow, auctions scare the shit out of me. They do to me too. I and the market up there has really dropped since. Not the market's dropped, but but definitely lower buyer interest since the cyclone came through start of the year. So it's going to be interesting. We'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed, Aaron. Yeah. Oh, I hope so. I hope it, yeah. Don't have any dummy bidding or anything like that happening. I know no, a couple of days. You happy to get on plane? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was quick. That was... Oh, uh, look, we will see. We'll see this, what is it, about 26 hours time? We'll know the fate. All right, let's bring this, let's bring it to a close. <laughs> no, I need it. I need to sleep. All right, let's let's wrap it up. I'll catch you later, guys. Thanks, guys. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you're a sophisticated investor under Australian law, we'd welcome you to sign up to our investor syndicate where we'll notify you of investment opportunities as they come up. If you're a B2B founder and think Tribe would be a fit for you, go to Get Capital page of our website. And whether you're a founder or an investor, if you're looking to take your early stage investing or company to the next level in 2024, consider joining one of our offsites or US and UK market entry missions occurring in February, March, May, June, August, and November. 